Because I didn't know I was a surprise. <laughs> when you looked at me, I thought, ah, I am the surprise. <laughs> so, well, uh, am I allowed to spend a minute to, since I also was quite isolated here in the north of Italy, this is Italy, you know, this is Rome and Sicily, and I'm here in the northeast on the border with Slovenia and Austria. Uh, so I give you my introduction. I was asked here a few times what made you uh, start with the Amiga and so on. Well, I, my father had a pet CDM with no software. I had to write software for it, which I found gratifying, creative, and everything. Uh, then I was dreaming in color. Big 20 came, so I was already sort of grounded with Commodore and scan lines. Uh, and when the Amiga came, it was the best hardware, the best software at an affordable, reasonably affordable price. Uh, I remember, I still remember the moment I saw the cover of the Byte magazine at the Houston, and that was for me the moment I, I thought, that's my dream machine for next year. So, but I was too in isolation, uh, as you mentioned. For me, the closest place to see uh, computer books uh, and, and actual Amigas was Munich, and my grandparents was, were in Germany, south of Munich. So when we went uh, there in summer and uh, for Christmas, I used to take the train every time and to visit, uh, you know, Google and uh, what else there were there, the first Amiga stores there. And when in 1986 the Amiga came to Europe, actually, I had already studied the Bantam Amiga DOS book, the Edison Wesley books, and so on, that I had learned C theory. So it was time to put things into practice. So those were great years. Uh, we, we were blessed to, to be able to join the DevCons, the development community, to write, I, I wrote a word processor and a software for the handicapped, and then with a larger team we wrote uh, Personal Paint, with, which also with Colin's help and the team at uh, Congo UK was bound with every Amiga sold for a while uh, after Electronic Arts. Uh, had its own deep paint that we were better, more advanced than uh, AGA, RTG, and um, for other reasons as well. So we had uh, good times, and then we witnessed also the collapse. In a way, some of the more ugly things, when you don't have oxygen for everyone, it's like a pond which is shrinking and fishes become sharks. So in 97, uh, we went more into preservation mode, let's say. Uh, business software, uh, software you do for money and growth was uh, for Windows systems and we put our software on net. And still, however, it was important for me to uh, enable, in that case, since it was a 97 was a year in which these things were debated uh, on the border between legality and non legality, to make a legal Amiga regulation. So we did that already with the gateway companies at the time. And so Amiga Forever was born. It was successful, maybe too successful in a way, because now people say, ah, oh, you only do preservation. And if they don't know about the previous past, and uh, I still use my Amiga almost every day in emulation, that's where my Amiga 3000 is, because I still use some of my own legacy software, and I go back to old things. Um, so, uh, beauty for me is important. Amiga was about excellence, uncompromising excellence, beauty. I often say that, just like religion once used to long for beauty, and we see that in, in beautiful artwork from centuries ago, now it's maybe more something a bit more individualistic. But we have a religion here. We lost a little bit of the youth, maybe. And uh, I'd love it if it could uh, raise our spirits a little bit and, uh, and let's see outside of the current problems what the solutions could be and uh, bring back some of that uncompromising freedom, beauty, and excellence, and so on. Maybe it won't be uh, a huge thing, but a little both side where we can all work together <coughs> to work on something beautiful. So, um, in the past few years, there was a flaring up again of some legal uh, doubts and challenges, and in this context, uh, a few good things were born. Uh, among them, Amiga Inc., uh, after some years where they had some overdue taxes, uh, was brought back to good standing, and the shareholders decided to sell. So, after almost two years of negotiations, um, in, Feb in January, uh, Bill McEwen was reappointed by the shareholders uh, CEO, so he could finish signing the paperwork, and actually, the shareholders already had approved in multiple rounds of voting uh, negotiations uh, to sell and all these things. So on um, February 1st, uh, 
really under new acquisition company acquired uh, all the assets of Omega Inc. Previously, already, Grant had acquired copyrights years ago. So it is the intention now to merge this into this new entity, or maybe a new entity, and possibly we are going to add a non-profit, a foundation. So it's something I've been speaking about, as you know, for many years now. Um, this will be done once the legal uncertainties are resolved. As you know, we have a case with Hyperion. I'm in touch with Timothy, who is the CEO almost every day now. By the way, he just asked me how is Ami West going. So, hello, Timothy. I'm sure we'll chat again tonight. And um, so, we are working to resolve this too now, so that there will be more clarity also about some things which there were doubts about outside of all <coughs> I think uh, there have been also exciting uh, years, and uh, 2019 especially on the front of new hardware and software developments, and uh, we want to make uh, more things possible. We want to bring, um, to preserve continuity of everything that is being done now, but also to make new things possible. And a similar uh, umbrella without uncertainties, like in the back, in the Commodore days, when you were able to be a developer, and we're not afraid of, of trademark grabbers or some others, uh, you know, lawsuits or whatever, who owns what. This is also uh, something that now is more clear already. For many years, um, even recently, there have been campaigns to say, ah, everything is shady, it's not clear who owns what. Now it is more clear. Uh, so CIA Position Corp um, owns the Amiga assets and will soon also own their copyrights as soon as the situation with Hyperion is resolved. And also, um, uh, it's a pop there was no copy tonight. <laughs> uh, so, um, who owns what? It was one of the, of the, of the grey areas uh, that often comes up, and the other one, no, I don't remember. So, uh, yes, the acceptance, uh, the, the moral side of things. Uh, we, there's a gray area also uh, that it seems to be almost accepted for the past 10, 15 years that in the mega world, uh, not some corruption, but shady things happened. And, and they have to happen. I don't like this. It wasn't the case in the first years uh, when we were developers with Conova at least for us developers, and it should not be acceptable or normal now, I think. If you, if you <laughs> see something, say something, you know. Uh, it, it, it's not like, of course we all love Omega, uh, we do things in spite of these things, not because of these things, but uh, I would like to have a future with a bit more um, courage to stand up if something is working, as, as it should be. So, uh, the more I speak, the more I take away time uh, for your questions. And then here also to, to, ask, to answer some of the difficult questions. And it's a, uh, a discourse I would like to bring forward uh, with the community. That's why I try to attend uh, almost as many events as travel. And um, so, stay, stay, stay with you and be in touch. And uh, we can create a nice and clean Amiga entity, I think. Uh, uh, on the Commodore branch, some pieces are missing, as you may know. Uh, you know, an ESCOM sold to uh, Gateway, uh, the Chicken Lips logo had already gone to Tulip. So uh, the duality remains, the historical duality between the California Amiga team and the East Coast Commodore and Commodore Amiga. And uh, at least we can, I hope, uh, bring back a strong and clean uh, Amiga corporation or something like that. I could also, also they the As for, as for a foundation, a non-profit, so that um, combines also with some open source work. I would love to help bring forward and also some educational work and preservation because that too is important. I think we have some beautiful systems that should not be remembered. Um, sorry, <laughs> I've been meeting and working with preservation institutions in several countries, uh, three of them here in California, and um, there can be so much more than preservation. These are beautiful systems that fit in your mind, that are static, that are great for learning, I think, so whether on a tablet or whether on new remade hardware, 
uh, new generation, uh, th they're nice uh, cultural elements to learn and to belong also to something different, to see a different pers perspective of things, and so on. So, if there are questions... How do you see balancing the for-profit and the non-profit? Well, <laughs> well, if you, if you yeah, can answer that already, I don't mean to do it on a fair spot, but you know, it just seems... Yeah. So, um, transparency, the Amiga, with sites like Amiga Documents and Amiga World and Amiga Org, who have been very uh, attentive to changes and whatever happened, we have had a, a prime example of radical transparency where everybody who's an active player and does something is scrutinized, analyzed, exposed. And I, probably because of my shy, shy and introvert nature, I, it took me some time to also think and accept this year to be a bit more exposed. Okay. So, uh, I, for one, like an engineer who's not a good salesperson, <laughs> I tell you the negative, and I know I, um, I'm, not, I'm not inclined to saying before doing, yeah. I'm not inclined to maybe maintaining a blog or something, which I should be doing, and actually the Amiga.com side is part of the acquisition, and we'll start using that soon, I hope. Not only for the secret messages. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, yes, I believe in that. I, we have seen now that the culture of secret meetings, uh, whether they are real or not, from Army West or from Germany and mm -hmm. so on, mm -hmm. there's understandably uh, a reaction to that. So, uh, but again, I, I am in a beautiful area. Um, there was a debate where would you should, at our table, for example, where should you hold? Uh, the California meetups uh, in the Bay Area, here or there. I think it's also nice, um, blending it also with this other topic, to meet in different places. So, like you came from Denmark to visit us in Italy and so on. I'm one hour from the top of the Alps and from the beach, so it's a beautiful area where we too could uh, once in a while organize <coughs> something else. We did. We did this Amiga Alpearia, which then became Codex Alpearia. So, um, Yes, you must please ask me a question, help me this, and force me to answer, like we did uh, in your 10 minutes uh, retrocast here, there, yes. We should do one more, maybe even from here. Mm -hmm. And let's keep doing this. Uh, so. let's, let's ask me the difficult questions, and uh, it is my duty, yes, to keep informed, not everything can be uh, said every time now as part of the negotiation some things are in NDA but um, that's why I'm here. And the second part, um, the second part of the was how, you know, how do you think, I mean maybe it's a bit un too early to answer this but you know, how do you think you're going to balance the for-profit element ah, yeah, right. with a non-profit well, element? Yeah, right or not for-profit element? You know, now we have some quite good times in our company but um, we had some more difficult times like 10 years ago. Mm. And at the time, so we we don't count our time spent in Amiga forever, which is in large part already a volunteer work. But uh, I don't count my hours. I don't get paid for my for my Amiga yeah. work. So already now, yes, I want these projects to be like ideally break even. Yeah. But they are break even only if you don't count your time. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think. Um, Look at the example of the 314 developers. I spoke with Marcus last week, 10 days ago. Uh, he told me, no, we wanted this to be done for free. The, this, I also worked with volunteers in the emergency field. And uh, whether it's in that field or with open source, there are some fascinating aspects in the volunteer culture also. I think it would be easier to participate, to contribute code. Uh, if, if it was a non-profit organization, or maybe a project, now we have also the fiscal sponsors, for example. I've seen here in California, they use a lot. That could also be an option. And um, uh, so, 
and then you could also contribute money. Maybe some people already said, "I'll give you fifty thousand if you make it open source." And, and, mm -hmm. and, and this, of course, uh, I, I'm not afraid of bureaucracy. I come from a country of bureaucracy. Yeah. Not only that, I come from the north where this is applied in a German way, so it's really strangling. <laughs> so you have high precision application of complex rules, and uh, so a no profit doesn't scare me, but. Um, uh, also, there are many, many examples, I think. It's a topic I've been researched, I've researched, and I have in my family, uh, also a California non-profit. Um, many companies have a, a non-profit mm -hmm. owned by the for sorry, not owned, but uh, which, which has parts which yeah. are integrated yeah. with the for-profit, or one owned by the other. So uh, one does not exclude the other. Actually, a non-profit may have uh, Employees. I know people in, in for profits. Now I'm the, playing the devil's advocate. Yeah. I'm sure there's many uh, non profits here uh, I visited that have a salary which is 10 times mine. So, uh, that, that too. So, you can be evil also as a non profit yeah. if, if that's the point. However, however, the non profit has some other advantages. It's owned not by a person, it's owned by the public. So, if I die or something, uh, after we did all the hard work to recollect all the assets, they did the copyrights, uh, contributions by third parties, which were in part lost and fragmented. Uh, either, and th these have been my talks as a year ago, they go to some preservation entity which is already non-profit or uh, recognized as a library or an institution like that, or it should be its own. So there's many other existing foundations. Now, uh, Linux Foundation comes to mind, there are others which are working with others in mm -hmm. collaboration to such projects. So I don't think one excludes the other, but rather it makes possible more again. So, and again, please be a critical observer and uh, have an active role as well. So, Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Michael? Yeah. Yeah, Michael, um, I may have misheard something, so <coughs> excuse me if the question's wrong. Um, you said that um, CBM Commodore was acquired by Tulip, uh, but then you said that you bring back 8-bit into the... Yes, what do we do with the 8-bit copyrights? We, they were assigned to us years ago because we acquired the copyrights. So uh, they're not staying, I think, in Toronto if the new Commodore Amiga Amiga entity is going to be the new company. I would like to separate the, the B2B company doing other things which have nothing to do with Amiga, come on Amiga, that should be it. Eight bit is eight bit stuff you did before with C sixty four for everything like that. Yes. Or the Commodore name, that's what it was. No no, copyrights is not trademarks, yes. So uh, the Chipulips logo was sold in the nineties to Tulip. I, I respect the transaction. The result may be a trademark that perhaps now is weaker, but it took a different way. So Yes, so the copyrights, uh, it, it's almost an inverse acquisition. You have the California company, which was acquired by Commodore, and then it, then ends, up, it ends up again as an Amiga company who, which owns some of the 8-bit assets. In a way, it's a circle. As for naming, you should maybe have a, a survey about the possible names of things. I would love the, the boot screen to have the original name, you know, not Toronto to Imperium in the boot name. And now I'm talking too much. I said go on. Go on. Other things. It is uh, the only that. That's, that's <laughs> <not bad. laughs> okay. I'm, yeah. Mike, I've been personally very uh, vocal about my dislike and distrust of Hyperion and my support of you personally. And. Uh, more of a uh, statement than a real question is we're counting on you. I'm counting on you. Thank you. Not to sell out. I know you have to negotiate because the, the continued fighting is not doing anyone any good. But please don't sell out on your, your goals and your dreams just, just to make it easier. Don't take the easy way out, is what I'm trying to say. Is, um, it helps what you say because sometimes, yes, we get some some messages of support, but of course not always uh, 
the, 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 the noise and the, the extreme elements sometimes there are for the other sides as well. So thank you for your kind words. I, I should stay still and just think about what you just said for a minute. But um, yes, as you said, um, negotiations are necessary. We'll see if it works. And um, we are ready to for it to end either way, of course. So maybe things resume if it doesn't work out. Um, but um, yeah, at the most it will take one or two years. As I said last week in Germany, it's not an Italian court case, which can take 10 years or more. And um, yeah, thank you for what you said. Mike? Hi, I'm, I'm actually relatively new to the media community, about three years now. And when I joined in, I was pretty happy to see the next-gen machines that were out there and that that community was alive and um, also being a fan of Amiga, Amiga Forever and seeing how that's alive. Um, and then I learned a little bit about the, the legal grumblings that are going on. And from my perspective, I'm wondering if you could share with us, because I don't understand all the details of, of with the legal battles being where they are, seeming like they're settling down, um, what kind of activities or projects or things does this free you up to pursue that you may not have otherwise been able to pursue, if you're able to speak to that? Well, there's been some, for me, lack of clarity about what some companies could do outside of OS4. OS4 has never been disputed. Uh, we respect that all the parties that work with respect to the 2009 settlement agreement, which came at a conclusion of lawsuits that started already in the 2000s. So this dates back to, I think, 15 years ago, 17 years ago. You can read everything about this in sites like Amiga Documents, which is a good, there's hundreds of pages of PDFs you can read from that court case and you can see what happened. Um, I am aware of several players who, not knowing themselves what the second agreement said, because different parties claimed it said different things, they were they felt paralyzed. They quit. They quit maybe because also some interpretations of it were were very strong or intensely defended by some. So. I think uh, the agreement wasn't well written in 2009. And uh, so we want that clarity. And when you have clarity, even a yes or no, which is not something strange in between, it helps everyone. And uh, I am counting on uh, NG to move forward, OS4, with many active players. Trevor is active in the hardware and the software front directly and indirectly. Uh, there's many active people who would be more active with the classic font. Uh, there could be something open source. And that, for example, is something that Hyperion itself said they would be able to do. But we, as the copyright owners, I'm in agreement with Hyperion, uh, could make new things possible also there. So, for example, open source would be both in a, in, the, in a positive outcome of the court case, and also, I would hope, it's already in, in, in settlement talks. So that, that, that's something I've been talking about uh, for long before the, the, the legal case flared up again. So you can see old videos. I think, uh, the Computer History Museum a few years ago, four years ago, these topics in part already came up as possibilities. Now they are more closer, they feel closer. Thank you. Thank you. This, this should be on now. <laughs> yes. Uh, I had a question because um, it's very confusing right now that um, when I boot up Amigo S 4.1, look at the about requester, it says copyright 1985 Hyperion Entertainment on it. Well, uh, 85. And I'm like, I, how do you go back in time and come no, that? So I'm not going to comment about this because it has been publicly exposed also in the court case. It is one of the 
you're not the first to ask it. It's in black and white right there. It says, but I'm not going to, to say anything about this. It's there. I, I mean, I agree with you. It's strange and... Uh, <coughs> Yeah, but you might stand right now. What's that? Are you going to ask the question? Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Get away from the speaker. There's another cross there. When you ask. <laughs> <laughs> He's very strict about where he places all of us. There are other sense. boxes that I know where they are. Yeah. It's a control <laughs> thing with Bill. It's a control thing. Hi, Michael. Um, I was very excited when I got my C64 Mini to see Cloanto's name on there, uh, that you were involved in licensing of that. Is, it, it is the new... Amiga company that you're working on, is it, is it really going to be directed more towards licensing uh, agreements with other companies who, who make or produce some kinds of hardware? Or are you maybe looking to become involved, not making hardware yourself obviously, but in becoming more involved with the actual hardware and product that, that may come out in the future? Good question. I think um, both because the software and the hardware are not unrelated. There needs to be, when you start even licensing, because you don't have the capabilities to produce a house, I think you need to define some reference, some reference hardware. So let's say you add USB, you add PCI, you, you decide how this new virtual O80 CPU, does it have MMU, FPU, how does it do it? and you want the OS to support it, I think there need to be some experts who say, okay, as an expansion of the existing hardware, which can be replicated, and we already said the schematics uh, would be public for, for use, um, and making things possible, but when you add things like this, there should be some involvement, so that as part of the licensing of the Amiga mark to make this an Amiga, I mean, which is supported by the operating system, there's some, a test suite and a reference framework saying what additions this should be. Otherwise, uh, they're not supported by the software and vice versa. So I think um, that the operating system should run on a system that is called Amiga, maybe powered by Amiga for some systems. And uh, so there's a, a link between the two with quality and hardware reference framework. Um, this is both for classic and, uh, and for new generations now. Thank you. Uh, um, yes, that's good. 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 Give your understanding of the current state of the art, state of the union, um, on the issues at hand that you're trying to resolve between, and, and maybe break it down between um, classic, next gen, copyrights, trademarks, trade names. There are a bunch of things in the air. Um, you, you had started to touch on them, it's just more for clarity uh, of the audience than anything else. Because, like you said, th there are things that are related to OS4, things that are not related to OS4, things that are related to both, trade names, for example, some copyrights <coughs> tied to one or the other. The, each of these things have practical implications for go forward. Uh, if you could give a, a, a snapshot as best you can. And then, what's up for debate? Yes. Well, thank you. And please stand by to guide me and put me back on track because, as you said, you're a lawyer, you are an Amiga fan, you wrote, can I, can I say that, I said, you, you wrote a 3,300-page <laughs> manual to bring new developers in a cross-platform uh, development environment to write Amiga software with, with Visual Studio and to integrate tools. So, so you, are, you, you spend your own time and love to bring more Amiga developers. And that's great. Um, well, the question I've, tried, I've been trying to ask and get answered for many years, uh, outside of OS4, are there any claims or anything that is covered by the settlement agreement? Yes or no? This is, a, in theory, it should be a simple question. But every time it was asked, 
and economics to find an answer. It's now part of the things that need to be resolved in the court case. So OS4 has never been challenged as part of the legal proceedings, but there are different interpretations on, on, on everything else. And, and you can read this, since they are care carefully worded things written by lawyers, I, <laughs> I'm not able to repeat them with the proper wording, but it, it boils down, down to uh, can others register trademarks, can they use things outside of OS4, or were they just licensed for OS4, and this obviously has consequences on what the Amiga companies can do if they want to outside of OS4. And the same is also part of settlement negotiations, obviously. So I'm not telling you anything new. And once this is resolved, uh, one branch or the other of classic, which now has received renewed interest. So when there's, you know, when there's no interest, are they only do emulation and or maybe it's a few hundred uh, ROMs a year that go in classic support or you know some floppy disks they don't even make them anymore so how many can they sell as long as these are the numbers we've been talking about for the last 15 years or so uh, we've been doing classic support for a bit more than 10 years now I think uh, no more than that anyway uh, people are not so worried oh, money may be limited, but when you see new projects that sell maybe in the tens or hundreds of thousands, and then you see the sharks again, which are similar sharks to the one I mentioned from 97, when there's not enough oxygen for everyone, but with the Mega 30 events, I noticed <coughs> that there were hundreds of people, some people thought at, at these events, and some thought, oh, this is something interesting, it's bigger than I thought. They didn't know that it was everyone. So survival bias, right? But um, so that's when I again felt a bit of, of a more um, aggressive, an aggressive, uh, uh, act, very too active maybe for me stance by some new newcomers, which I respect. I mean, we I want this community to be inclusive. I would like to see more children, more young people here also playing with systems. And uh, the, the, new, the newcomers should be put in the center of the room, introduced, and they can be a long-term, vital uh, part of the future. But um, if, if you think there's money to be made uh, as just by grabbing a few things and, and trying to push long-standing members aside, and well, maybe yes, sometimes you need uh, some, some to shake up things, uh, to see new perspectives. But uh, some bad things also came up at the Amiga 30th, I think. And uh, some quickly went away because they saw that we are on size, and on size may be you know, so interesting for some, but uh, still there's been a contamination of things of, by some people who think they can get rich with it. I don't think you can get rich with this. So I think if you do it for money, honestly, I think you're doing it wrong, at least Amiga-wise. But we can create beauty. And that is a good motivation for me. One last question. It's really a comment, a comment, really. Actually, AM's already a non profit. But so is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you are quite sure. AM is not a non profit. Yeah, but uh, I invented this first because, yeah, as I said, we, we too, our projects were in red or barely breaking even no, for many years. And I can tell you more, one more joke. How will you become an Amiga millionaire? No? Start with Amiga billionaire. Yes. You start as an Amiga billionaire and you end up an Amiga millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> and we had billion, we had billionaire, we had billionaire investors. Remember, Amiga. One of the reasons why Amiga was also hyped and distorted and difficult to understand. Um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, before the big uh, crash, we had a billionaire investor, Dr. Curry, and the Amiga shareholders, when I saw the list, I realized, ah, oh, these are still his connections. And it's uh, who's who in culture and arts and finance and IT. It's an interesting street. So it was a legacy uh, of those days. 
and it didn't work out for one reason or the other. So. Hey, Michael, there's a question from the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. During the uh, Amiga 34 show, Ian Schoenfield was pretty vocal about not attending because of disputes around I believe, licensing of software. Do you have any comments about Jens, or is there anything going on to heal the, the rift there? Well, um, we, in 2001, we had an email-based agreement with uh, CAS96 developers. It was for the software, then current with minor updates. It was a good email exchange, which I had to ask the German lawyers consider the valid contract. There was a payment. And um, for me, the case was closed back in 2001, also for the to the US and Alexander. Then we never thought that maybe you need a better contract because someday Class 96 would change ownership and this license could be disputed somehow. So uh, the reasons for the dispute, uh, the fronts or these things, they are really quite enmeshed and complex. Uh, friendships, or what I thought were friendships, turn sour. and. Uh, so we, I asked permission to publish the email exchange from 2001. If you Google, if you Google like Amiga Forever, Picasso 96, you will see the actual announcement from 2001, and at the bottom there's this addition, which for transparency adds the email exchange from 2001 without the personal path, because by German law we have to remove them, but it's just the email addresses and the bank details and these things. And, uh, <coughs> Yeah, it's an ugly story. It's one of the, I think in a larger community, uh, in a, so not huge, but diverse, you have to have two or three painful elements. I mean, I see that as, it would be too perfect if there were not some rough spots maybe. I was able to shake hands with Jens uh, two weeks ago, uh, but, uh, he and a few others were part of a uh, uh, kind of thought that would have preferred that uh, the 2001 agreement was not valid or that, uh, yeah. It's really, you must see, that there's more things behind the scenes. Uh, you must see connections and agreements between other people to understand maybe the motives. And I think I already spoke too much about this because it's not the beautiful but does it answer the question? That's what I, do you think it answers the question? Well, I think there's a lot of people that look at what uh, Jens Schoenfeld has done for classic hardware uh, over the last Probably, 20 years. But it's not disputed. Yeah. But no, so, I just, yeah. but I, I, the, I think the, the, the tenor of the question was, can, is, is there gonna be a resolution to the rift? Because I think the community values both contributions and it seems like this could be something to be worked out. But what is the rift? Please tell me what the, the yes was very was the yes was uh, posting about yes the Mega 34 not going because of the dispute on Cosmo 96, right? I think the post that was leaked and it was not leaked by the yes. No, this is, this is about, just, this just what a week and a half ago. Yes, no, it was before 34. The reason why he said he did not attend. I think was the legal case as a whole. It was not the Picasso 96 thing. And it was, the reason was in a personal email to the event organizers and some others. And one of the recipients leaked it. So it was instrumentalized. I would say it was, this email was, was used again for some reasons. And uh, it was not about Picasso 96 though. It was about the legal case. They said if, if Hyperion loses, and they are Hyperion part, the parent loses, you know, they, they express their position about that of supporting the parent. I, that's how I see it. Or maybe you can remind, refresh me because it's a long time ago that I saw that email. No, no look, I, I don't want to get in the middle of this. <laughs> Clearly something was going on between ICOM and Jens and yourself yes. around something. Well, so I answered to you about the Castle 96 and also about the leaked email where he supported Hyperion and not any one of the Amiga parties who were sued by Hyperion and who might win or lose. So that's a good answer for me, I think.
I don't, I don't, I don't know what else to say. I mean, I didn't bring up the dispute. I never disputed his hard work over the years, the quality of his products or support, or um, anything. I, I was quiet on the whole issue. I never brought up any problem. So this is something that came up outside of me, and I'm asked to answer, but I don't have much to say other than, okay, I've been talking about this thing from 2001. Here is what it is. Make up your own mind. It's not that there is a lawsuit. It's just that there is this uh, the word that was used is shit shitstorm, no, <laughs> in public forums. But uh, I didn't post or leak or anything. It came up for good reasons, weaponized reasons. Another word that we have a few. Um, you said every year there's new buzzwords in the middle of the world. No? Now we have weaponization, shitstorm. <laughs> but please, I was talking about beauty. <laughs> So I, I don't, so you're asking me for answers for things I didn't bring up and with which I don't agree. I, so if you don't agree that there's a valid license soon, I, I don't know what to say, don't make a shit song. <laughs> a little present. <laughs> so why did you get well, a you, license you, for this? You're, you're not. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Actually, uh, okay, take care. I bought this from Randomize, who made it for Amiga Inc. So yeah, it's I'll legit. Uh, my baby boy has oh. both uh, rats, as you know, rats were eradicated in Alberta, and that's why Stephen has been giving rats to babies and children and developers here. <laughs> so thank you for the rat, and thank you for Paul, and uh, <laughs> but I, you, came, you could have come up with the t-shirt I bought Amiga, right? Yes. Thank you for not doing that. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I own. I own. Okay. Yeah. Right. It's my own amigo. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You're not in the box. You stepped out of the box. I did, but I thought you were going to win. I thought you were going to win. It's almost Germany. It's <laughs> box. <laughs> box. <laughs> I know. No, this is very restrictive. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Michael, uh, and you thank you for clarifying some things for not only us, but our online audience as well. So uh, this concludes the banquet. It opens up the gameplay for uh, this room, and of course, as we, those of us who have been here before know, there's another uh, meeting. It's not secret. Uh, it's done in the great room usually, so uh, we'll see those of you who want to participate down there in a little while. But uh, let's have another hand for Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. See you tomorrow morning uh, at 10.